Due to the graphic nature of this murder case, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes dramatizations and discussions of murder, sexual assault, domestic abuse, and suicidal ideation that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. In 1964, the city of Boston, Massachusetts, was in a state of terror. At least 13 innocent people had met the same grisly fate, death by strangulation. Their killer was dubbed the Boston Strangler, and he was still on the loose. Newspapers speculated about the Strangler's true identity. They said he had to be a deranged criminal, possibly an escapee from a local psychiatric facility. Locals let their imaginations run even further. Some Bostonians claimed the Strangler had superpowers. Rumor had it that the murderer could punch holes through brick and scale walls like a spider. But the truth was far less fantastical and far more disturbing. The Strangler was a man whose earliest memories were profoundly traumatic. His father was physically and emotionally abusive and once broke all his mother's fingers right in front of him. In many ways, the Boston Strangler never had a chance to be normal. Violence and cruelty had always been woven into his existence. And as an adult, he developed an insatiable desire to inflict pain on others. It was almost like he wanted everyone else to suffer as much as he did. By the time police finally tracked him down, The Boston Strangler was one of the most hated men in Massachusetts. He had plenty of enemies. So when the Strangler himself became a victim of murder, nobody knew who to blame. This is our first episode on the death of the Boston Strangler. This week, we'll follow law enforcement as they work to uncover the Strangler's identity. Next week, we'll cover the killer's arrest and his own mysterious unsolved murder. We have all that and more coming up. Stay with us. The summer of 1962 brought sweltering heat to the state of Massachusetts. People pushed open their windows, relishing even the slightest breeze. On June 14th of that year, -year 25-year-old Juris Slessers stood on a street corner in southwest Boston. He wiped the sweat from his forehead. He was waiting for his mother, 55-year-old Anna Slessers, to come down from her apartment. He was supposed to take her to an evening church service but she was taking forever. So he headed up the stairs of the complex and knocked on her door. There was no response. Juris thought perhaps his mother had gotten distracted while running errands. He was certain she'd be back soon, so he sat on the stoop and waited. But close to 30 minutes passed, and there was no sight of her. He climbed back up the stairs and pounded on the door. He put an ear up to the door and heard complete silence. Juris knew something was wrong. It was very unlike his mother to forget their plans. A wave of anxiety came over him. Without thinking twice, he rammed into the apartment door and knocked it down completely. He arrived at a scene that would scar him for the rest of his life. Anna Slesser's body lay limp in the hallway next to the bathroom. The cloth belt that was usually used to fasten her bathrobe had been tied around her throat. Juris was in shock. He couldn't cry or scream. All he could do was call the police. Boston police officer James Mellon arrived around 8.30 p.m. He surveyed the scene and was struck by the way Mrs. Slesser's body lay splayed on the ground. Her left leg jutted straight in front of her while the other stuck out at a right angle. It was an unnatural position. Goosebumps spread across Mellon's arms. Someone had specifically arranged her body that way. As he looked further, Mellon found that someone had combed through the bathroom trash. Mrs. Slesser's dresser had been flung open and her clothes were put out of order. The record player was on, but the speaker had been turned off. 
Officer Mellon felt sick to his stomach. This was clearly the scene of a murder. Officer Mellon's first order of business was to interview Anna Slesser's neighbors. He needed to know if anyone had seen or heard anything out of the ordinary on the night of her death. The man who lived directly below Mrs. Slesser's offered up a bit of information. Well, there was something a bit odd about this evening. I laid down for a nap around six o'clock, and a few minutes later, I heard a loud bumping sound right above me. It sounded like someone plopped down a big piece of furniture. Then it was the strangest thing. You know that feeling you get when someone is creeping up behind you? I swear, I felt like someone was inside my apartment watching me. I couldn't sleep at all. Unfortunately, a sound and a creepy feeling weren't much to go on, so the case was left open, and days passed with no new developments. Officer Mellon found himself combing through the crime scene photos. It looked staged, like whoever did this hoped the cops would assume it was a botched robbery. And Mellon's suspicions were about to be confirmed. Two weeks later, another grisly murder shocked the city. On June 30th, 68-year-old Nina Nichols' landlord unlocked her apartment door. Nina's sister had called to request a wellness check. Apparently, the two women had dinner plans, and Nina never showed up. The landlord walked inside. The apartment was in a state of disarray. Drawers had been flung open, and pieces of clothing and jewelry littered the floor. Nina's bedroom door was wide open. Without thinking, the landlord went in. There, he saw Nina's naked body splayed out on the bed. Two nylon stockings had been tied around her neck. The landlord had never seen anything so awful. He ran outside and called the police. A few minutes later, an officer named Lieutenant Sherry arrived at the scene with a team of detectives. Oh, God. Poor woman. Motive, Sherry. What's the motive? Uh, Looks like a robbery to me. It looks like it, but it's not. There's valuables everywhere. The killer didn't touch her jewelry or silverware. You're saying it's staged? I think so. Just like at Anna Slesser's apartment. Uh, Lieutenant Cherry? Uh Uh-huh. I think we're dealing with a serial killer. It made sense. There were clear similarities between both crime scenes. In addition to staged robberies, Lieutenant Sherry discovered something even stranger. Neither one of the victim's apartments showed signs of forced entry. That meant that whoever the faceless killer was, he must have been very charming, because it appeared that his victims willingly let him enter their homes. Police were starting to connect the dots, but the killer was still on the streets, and before police could track him down, he struck again. On July 2nd, officers found 65-year-old Helen Blake dead in her home. Her apartment was similarly ravaged, Her body lay in bed with a pair of nylon stockings wrapped tightly around her throat. Signs of sexual assault were apparent. No expensive belongings had been removed from the home. This was the third strangulation in a period of just three weeks. Boston Police Commissioner Edmund McNamara knew he needed to take action. He denied all requests for leave and reassigned every detective on the force to homicide. He pulled all sex offender files out of the archives. The police checked up on every man between the ages of 18 and 40 years old who had been recently dismissed from nearby psychiatric facilities. Officers hung notices around every neighborhood in Boston, pleading with women to keep their doors locked, never allow strangers inside, and report any instance of strange behavior. They opened a number for a new emergency hotline and published it in the newspapers throughout the city. By July 1962, The killer had earned his own moniker, the Boston Strangler. Even though knowledge of the crimes was ubiquitous throughout the city, major questions remained. People, police officers included, weren't totally certain that the Boston Strangler was one person. The murders could have been the work of a single killer, but they also could have been committed by a gang or perhaps by copycat killers. 
The possibility of not just one killer, but many, struck terror into the hearts of Bostonians. And the police commissioner wasn't immune to the public's distress. He was still in his first month of the job and knew this was an important moment to prove that he was up to the task. But the crimes just kept coming. On August 21st, the police received a panicked call from the landlord at yet another Boston apartment complex. I take care of an apartment building on the West End. One of my tenants, Ida Erga, people hadn't been hearing from her, so I went to check up on her and she wasn't moving. Something was around her neck. Please, come quickly. When the detectives arrived, the first thing they noticed was a white pillowcase tied tightly around Ida Erga's throat. All the rest of the signs were there too. The ransacked apartment, no traces of forced entry, an elderly female victim. All the valuables were still intact. The Boston Strangler had struck again. Coming up, the Boston Strangler's killing spree continues. And now, back to our story. By early August 1962, the Boston Strangler had claimed the lives of four women. His latest victim was 74-year-old Ida Erga, and as news of her murder spread, Boston fell into an even deeper state of panic. Rumors circulated, and they became more and more bizarre with each passing day. You know, Frank has a friend on the force. He said the Strangler supposedly has some sort of superhuman strength. I know it sounds crazy, but there were holes punched through brick walls at that first murder scene. My cousin's a prosecutor, and he told me that the Strangler scales the walls of the apartment buildings. He apparently uses some sort of grappling hook. I'm getting new locks on the house. You think locks can stop a man with super strength? Well, I'm not saying you shouldn't take precautions. I just mean he could be anybody, you know? He could be standing inside the supermarket right now. The media only perpetuated this paranoia. Countless theories and speculative stories ran in the local papers. But after a full summer of panic, the Boston Herald tried to calm the city's nerves by publishing an editorial titled, Hysteria Solves Nothing. For the rest of the population, there ought to be some comfort in statistics. If it may be fairly said the police are looking for a needle in a haystack, it may be said with equal validity that a given person's chance of becoming a victim of the killer or killers are almost nil. And it worked. The essay was well received. It felt as though people were really taking it to heart. But the piece didn't last. Six days later, on August 30th, 67-year-old Jane Sullivan's dead body was found in her first floor apartment. A medical examiner determined that she'd been dead for nearly a week. Again, there were clear signs of sexual assault and the strangler's signature flourish. Two nylon stockings wrapped tightly around her neck. The exact time of Jane's death was estimated to be August 20th, the same day that Ida Erga was murdered. The strangler had claimed two victims in the span of 24 hours. Three months passed without another strangulation, but people's panic didn't subside. Over the summer of 1962, a number of women claimed that a man had been running through the halls of apartment complexes and slipping obscene notes underneath the doors. Only a week later, a student was arrested for using a small flashlight to gawk at women's feet while he masturbated in a movie theater. To the people of Boston, any one of these deviants could have been the strangler. In the wake of this mass paranoia, A local paper called the Boston Advertiser ran an open letter to the Strangler himself on their front page. It was entitled, Appeal to the Strangler. Don't kill again. Come to us for help. You are a sick man. You know it, although you are clever and smart enough to have avoided detection by the shrewdest detectives in this city. You need help. This appeal is to you, the man you were before this terrible urge overwhelmed you. You don't want to kill again but you know you will, unless you give yourself up. On September 5th, 
The chairman of Harvard University's Department of Legal Medicine met with the Boston Police Department, medical professionals, and psychiatrists for a conference. He told the crowd, Since robbery is not the motive, we are dealing with a demented man. There is nothing to tie these crimes together, no single piece of proof. The more such things happen, the more are likely to happen because the world is full of screwballs and there are so many around, we just couldn't begin to round them all up. We need a common denominator. And there were common denominators in these murders, although few and far between. All of the victims were elderly widows, and they each had links to medical work. Helen Blake and Jane Sullivan were nurses. Nina Nichols was a physiotherapist, and Ida Erga and Anna Slessers were both outpatients. Lieutenant Sherry racked his brain for a link between the murders. Clearly, each woman was strangled using a piece of clothing or bedding that belonged to them. But as he scrutinized the crime scene photos, he found one more similarity. The knot that tied off the murder weapon was always the same. It was called a granny knot, and it was consistent at all of the crime scenes. This breakthrough was proof positive that the killing spree was committed by a single murderer. And while Lieutenant Sherry breathed a heavy sigh of relief and triumph, he couldn't help but feel a little sick to his stomach. The fact that one man could be capable of committing this crime multiple times over was something that Sherry couldn't stomach. He had been on the force for a long time, but he had never come across a monster quite like this. Whoever the Boston Strangler was, his cruelty knew no bounds. On December 5th, 1962, another victim surfaced. The telltale signs were present. Ransacked apartment, valuables left intact, granny nut. But something was very different. The victim was 20-year-old Sophie Clark. She was at least three decades younger than all the Strangler's other targets. It seemed like the killer was breaking his own rules. The Strangler's clear M.O. was one of the few consistencies in this case. But with the death of Sophie Clark, any semblance of certainty had been obliterated. Officers had no idea how to track the Strangler or predict his next target. Three weeks later, 23-year-old Pamela Bassett was found murdered in her apartment in southwest Boston, not far from the home of the Strangler's first victim. The crime scene was all too familiar. Prior to December, the only people who truly felt at risk were elderly women. But now, as the Strangler's targets became younger and younger, it seemed like no one was safe. By New Year's Day of 1963, police hadn't found a single substantial clue. The death toll had reached seven, and Commissioner McNamara was mortified. A brief respite came in the form of a peaceful winter. Not a single strangulation was reported for five months, the longest the city had gone since the first murder. But Lieutenant Sherry and the rest of the Boston PD were just waiting for the Strangler's next move. And sure enough, on May 8, 1963, a man discovered the body of his fiancée, 26-year-old Beverly Sammons. The Strangler had changed his pattern again. While Beverly's body was found with the telltale stockings wrapped around her neck, she had also been stabbed 22 times. The Strangler was getting more aggressive. If there was ever a time for the police to double down on their efforts, it was now. 43-year-old Boston detective Phil Di Natale rose to the occasion. He resolved to catch the Strangler by any means necessary. I can just picture him in whatever sewer he sleeps in sneering to himself, saying, come and catch me, come and catch me, and I'm going to be the one to do it. Just you wait. These strangulation cases, Philly, I don't like what they're doing to you. Auntie, that's just the job. Someone dies, you spend an eternity beating your head against the wall, then hopefully you find the guy. That's just how it works. Well, I may know someone who can help you. With all due respect, how exactly could you help me? Give me the phone. Phil's aunt dialed a number. He could hear the voice from the other end. It was an attorney. His client was interested in talking to Phil, but he was hesitant. Apparently, he'd reached out to the police a number of times over the past year, but was ridiculed. 
Phil told his aunt that he was willing to take the man's client seriously. The lawyer hung up, and Phil and his aunt waited ten agonizing minutes for a callback. Finally, the phone rang. Hello, Detective. My client's name is James Davis. Are you familiar with him? Oh, God. Don't tell me. The psychic? Yes. He is a student of extrasensory perception. And I'm not particularly fond of your tone, Detective. I can assure you, Mr. Davis's abilities are nothing to laugh at. <sighs> well, look. I'll take any help I can get. I'll be at the station tonight at 7.30. We'll see you then. That evening, Detective Di Natale arrived at the station. He was greeted by James Davis, a balding man with broad shoulders and deep brown eyes. Davis spoke with a lisp, but every word that came from his mouth was delivered with confidence. Despite his reservations, the detective actually found the self-proclaimed psychic quite convincing. Perhaps this was just what the Boston PD needed to solve the case. Coming up, the Boston Strangler commits his most heinous crime yet, and the police finally uncover his true identity. And now, back to the story. In May of 1963, Detective Phil Di Natale met with self-proclaimed psychic James Davis. The clairvoyant wanted to help police track down the Boston Strangler. By that point, the strangulations had been going on for well over a year, and they didn't seem to be slowing down. All of the leads proved to be flimsy within a matter of days, so Detective Di Natale was willing to take any help he could get, even if it meant consulting with a local psychic. He couldn't prove anything. All he could do was express the thoughts and premonitions that came to him. He hoped they'd shed light on the case, but he couldn't guarantee it. With that in mind, he wanted to show the officers what he was capable of. He shut his eyes tightly and spoke through a sort of trance. I picture the Strangler as a tall man with bony hands, pale white skin, and his eyes. I am particularly struck by his eyes. He has a habit of pushing back this one curl of hair that falls on his forehead. One of his teeth is missing on the upper right side of his mouth. He's in a hospital of some sort. Detective Di Natale had no reason to believe any of this was accurate, but he was astonished by the level of detail Davis described. So he presented Davis with a stack of photographs. They were all of Boston men who'd been arrested for robbery or breaking and entering in the past year, and each of them had records of sexual assault. Davis chose a photograph from the middle of the stack. Without hesitation, He declared that this was the Boston Strangler. The man in the photograph was Arnold Wallace, a 26-year-old psychiatric patient at the Boston State Hospital. Phil had arrested Wallace after he tried to break into a tea shop the previous year. Phil remembered his drive back to the station with the young man. It had been disturbing. Wallace was almost impossible to communicate with. Whenever Detective Di Natale asked him a question, he'd either stare back at him blankly or go off on a tangent about how much he loved young girls. The detective had to hand it to James Davis. Out of anyone in that stack of photographs, Arnold Wallace seemed to be the most likely culprit, but still the officers weren't entirely convinced by Davis's ability. There were only about seven pictures, so it could have been a lucky pick. But Davis had another trick up his sleeve. He recounted the crime scenes of Sophia Clark and Anna Slessers with astounding precision, especially considering he'd never been to any of the places he described. From that moment forward, the officers working the Strangler case conferred with James Davis on a regular basis. For a while, he was a tremendous asset. Then, on May 20th, Detective Di Natale met James Davis and his attorney at the Boston State Hospital where Arnold Wallace was being held. By the time the detective arrived, Davis had already spoken with Wallace. Why are we here, James? Well, detective, my visions thus far have been strong, but not as strong as they could be. 
I'm positive that if I were to occupy the same physical space as Mr. Wallace, we could make great strides. And the two of you just spoke, correct? How'd it go? My goodness! If words could only do it justice. When I walked in, that strange boy looked up to me, and as my attorney introduced me, he simply said, I know. It's as if my intense fixation on him has been so powerful, it manifested a subconscious feeling of having met me before. Truly remarkable. Uh-huh. Remarkable. Right. For the detective, this was starting to feel like a stretch. There were people's lives at stake, and he was letting a man with no legal or policing background steer the ship. His fellow officers, however, were still compelled by Davis's abilities. In fact, the next big step in the investigation came directly from him. He insisted that the police bring Arnold Wallace in for a lie detector test. In early June, detectives Di Natale and Mellon escorted Arnold Wallace to the office of a private polygraph expert. During the test, Wallace could hardly answer a single question. When asked to focus on the polygraph, he seemed confused and fell silent. Accordingly, the results of the test proved inconclusive. More importantly, Mellon and Di Natale left the situation knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that Wallace was not their man. Wallace's IQ was 40 points below average, but the Strangler's crime scenes were methodical. Wallace was a poor communicator, yet the Strangler needed charisma and charm to enter so many women's homes. The facts just didn't add up. With that, the Boston Police Department's main suspect had been tossed to the side. There were a few other leads, but they all went cold. It was a somber note to begin the summer on. For the next few months, things were relatively peaceful in Boston. Come autumn, however, victims began falling like leaves off trees. Between September and November, two more women were found strangled in their homes. Then, on New Year's Day of 1964, the police received a call from 18-year-old Pamela Parker. <laughs> Please, send someone. It's horrible. Ma'am, calm down and slowly tell me what happened. The Strangler. It had to be him. I just know it. And Mary, she was only 19. What kind of monster? We'll send someone over right away. By that point, Boston police were fairly desensitized to the Strangler's crime scenes. But when they arrived at the third floor apartment, they realized that not only had the Strangler struck again, he'd ascended to a whole new level of depravity. 19-year-old Mary Sullivan's dead body was propped up against the backboard of her bed. She'd been sexually assaulted with a broomstick. A pink bow was tied around a pair of stockings wrapped tightly around her neck. It was like the strangler was leaving this body as a gift for the police to find. Lastly, and perhaps most sickening, a colorful postcard lay at her feet. It read, Happy New Year. This exceedingly brutal killing, punctuated by the lack of any new leads or substantial evidence, brought the investigation to an all-time low. However, on March 17th, 1964, everything changed. We have a perk being chased through the Harvard Yard, a bit over six feet tall, dark hair, requesting backup. Enter 29-year-old Albert DeSalvo. Police in Cambridge, Massachusetts, were called to the scene of numerous break-ins, and they found DeSalvo roaming the area. He took off on foot as soon as he saw the police cruiser. Before long, officers apprehended him and took him back to the station. When the police questioned DeSalvo about the break-ins, he completely broke down. He detailed his horrific childhood and the abuse he suffered at the hands of his alcoholic father. He told officers he'd been in and out of prison since he was a child. Finally, he cursed his father's name and repeated one sentiment over and over. How can you accept a man after he's done such things? What kind of a man is that? Clearly, DeSalvo was more than a petty criminal. He was a deeply disturbed and erratic individual. Police sent him to the Westboro State Hospital, where he was diagnosed with sociopathic personality disorder, 
Individuals with this disorder are often unable to empathize with others and have little regard for the law or the rules of society. After pleading innocent to charges of breaking, entering, and assault, he was released from police custody on an $8,000 bail. As was customary, DeSalvo's name and information was dispatched to a six-state network of police departments. The Cambridge police were immediately inundated with messages from detectives in Connecticut. As it turned out, DeSalvo was wanted in numerous districts for breaking into women's homes and tying them to their beds. On November 5th, police descended on DeSalvo's small home in Malden, Massachusetts. Officers booked him into Cambridge jail on December 10th, but he didn't last long in the prison environment. He allegedly started hearing voices. He complained to guards that his wife had snuck into his cell and was chastising him all through the night. He reported feelings of suicidal ideation. On January 14th, the court ordered him to be committed to the Bridgewater State Hospital for psychiatric evaluation. In this setting, DeSalvo was much more comfortable perhaps too comfortable. He made friends fast and boasted about crimes ranging from petty theft to rape. On March 7, 1965, he went too far. He told his ward mate, George Nasser, a secret that he couldn't take back. I've done it all, more than the police will ever be able to pin on me. To be honest, I've been duping them for years now. I've been pulling one over on this whole rotten city. Those stranglings, the Boston Strangler that they talk about in the paper, that's me, little old me, outsmarting the entire police department. When you think about it, it should be them in the loony bin, not me. Nasser called his attorney and told him about DeSalvo's confession. Within hours, the police were en route. They thought they'd been handed the Boston Strangler on a silver platter, but that wasn't the end of Albert DeSalvo's story. There was still one more murder waiting in the wings, the mysterious killing of the Strangler himself. On November 25, 1973, 42-year-old Albert DeSalvo was six years into a life sentence at Walpole Prison an infamous Massachusetts penitentiary. He couldn't deny that he was getting sick of being behind bars, so that day, he used the jail's phone to call his former psychiatrist. Dr. Ames Roby picked up. DeSalvo spoke in quick bursts, telling Roby that he wanted to set the record straight. Less than a decade prior, DeSalvo had confessed to being the Boston Strangler. He told his lawyer in a recorded conversation that he perpetrated a series of at least 11 brutal murders across the city. But now he wanted to recant his claims. He told Dr. Roby that he needed to clear his name. To make the story even juicier, he said he had new information about the Boston Strangler slayings. The implication was clear. DeSalvo wasn't just innocent, he also knew who the real Boston Strangler was. Dr. Roby was all ears, but Salvo said they needed to talk in person. Once the psychiatrist made it to the Walpole prison visitation area, DeSalvo would tell him everything he wanted to hear. But the doctor never got the chance to speak with his client. Mere hours after DeSalvo hung up the phone, he was found dead in his cell bed in the prison's infirmary. Bye. This is our second episode on the death of Albert DeSalvo, also known as the Boston Strangler. Last week, we discussed the serial killer's reign of terror and how the police finally tracked him down. This week, we'll look at DeSalvo's time in prison and investigate his mysterious death behind bars. We have all that and more coming up. Stay with us. After an arrest for a one-time burglary and assault in October 1964, Albert DeSalvo was released on bail, but not before his photo was sent out to police departments across six different states. Report after report began to come in painting DeSalvo as a serial rapist and burglar. 
By November of 1964, 33-year-old Albert DeSalvo was wanted for a string of rapes and burglaries in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. When police could no longer hold off their suspicions of DeSalvo, they booked him. Authorities didn't know it yet, but DeSalvo had committed even more crimes than they thought. After a childhood defined by his father's abuse, DeSalvo grew into a violent adult. It's believed that between 1962 and 1964, he'd gone on a vicious rampage through Boston and strangled at least 11 women. He created uniquely cruel crime scenes and often arranged his victims' bodies in unnatural poses and left behind greeting cards for law enforcement. In January 1965, while awaiting trial for his charges, DeSalvo appeared to suffer a mental breakdown. Claiming to hear voices, authorities transferred him to Bridgewater State Hospital for psychiatric observation. DeSalvo became the most frightening criminal institutionalized at Bridgewater. But he certainly wasn't the only killer that called the facility home. One of the first people DeSalvo met at the hospital was 34-year-old George Nasser. He'd been arrested after murdering a gas station employee that past fall. The men clearly had something in common, a propensity for extreme violence. So perhaps unsurprisingly, they got along quite well. Nasser was charming and he put DeSalvo at ease. They were often seen chatting in the Bridgewater common area. One day, DeSalvo had something he wanted to tell Nasser. Something important. We can't be sure exactly what DeSalvo and Nasser specifically said, but their conversation might have gone something like this. All right, Al, what is it? Okay, stick with me here. What would happen if a guy got put away for robbing one bank, but he really robbed a couple of banks? Like, let's just say, 11? You're telling me you stuck up banks? No, I'm not saying anything. I'm just asking. If someone gets locked up for one thing, and he actually did way more than the cops thought, what would happen? Enough with the games, Al. What are you trying to ask me here? You've heard of the Boston Strangler, right? At first glance, DeSalvo seemed like nothing more than a disturbed criminal with a big mouth. Now, it appeared that Nasser was seeing a totally different side of him. DeSalvo said he was the Boston Strangler, arguably the most prolific serial killer in the city's history. And perhaps because he spoke with such conviction, Nasser believed him. Nasser saw this as an opportunity. The Boston Police Department had set up a reward fund for anyone who helped them track down the strangler. If Nasser convinced DeSalvo to confess to authorities, he might get a cut of the money. Nasser put DeSalvo in touch with his lawyer, the infamous criminal defense attorney F. Lee Bailey. Bailey was known for securing favorable verdicts for defendants that were clearly guilty. According to Nasser, he was just the man DeSalvo needed. But the attorney seemed a little hesitant. Jailhouse confessions were frequent and oftentimes untrue. So Bailey got in touch with the Boston Police Department. He asked them to create a list of questions that only those who were intimately familiar with the crimes, that is, the police or the murderer, could answer. On March 6, 1964, Bailey arrived at Bridgewater Hospital with the questions in hand. He was determined to figure out if DeSalvo was taking him for a ride or if he was, in fact, the Boston Strangler. Patricia Bissett, does that name mean anything to you? Yes, sir. She was the sixth. No, seventh that I killed. Yeah, she was the one with the black jewelry box on her bureau and wrapped up Christmas presents on her bed. Anything else you can tell me about what happened at her apartment that day? Well, besides the obvious, I remember having a cup of coffee with me. I had to set it down on the floor while I, you know, I remember leaving and thinking to myself, dang, I think I left my coffee behind. Funny. Wow. Well, coffee cup left at the scene. That wasn't even in the papers. The conversation went on for hours. DeSalvo knew details about every victim, even going so far as to say what color scarf was beneath their sofa or what corner their bathroom was in. As far as Bailey could tell, the mystery of the Boston Strangler had been solved. DeSalvo was clearly the culprit. 
But before moving any further, Bailey thought of DeSalvo's wife and two children. The killer had been married to a German woman named Ermgart for 17 years. Throughout the Boston Strangler's reign of terror, Ermgart never considered that her husband was a murderer. But once he was arrested in Cambridge, Ermgart realized DeSalvo wasn't the man she thought he was. She took their children and fled nearly 2,000 miles away to Denver, Colorado. But F. Lee Bailey knew it was going to take much more than relocating to protect Amgart and her children. When word that Albert DeSalvo was the Boston Strangler got out, he would become public enemy number one, and no one close to him would be safe. Hello, Mrs. DeSalvo. My name is F. Lee Bailey, and I'm an attorney. I can't say much right now, but I just spoke with your husband. I know this may seem extreme, but I highly advise you to change your name. People are going to want to find you, and trust me, you do not want to play any part in this. Irmgart took the advice. She and her children disappeared, and their connection to Albert DeSalvo permanently dissolved. With that, Bailey officially signed on to be DeSalvo's lawyer. His goal wasn't to help the killer walk free, but rather to save him from the death penalty. Ideally, he hoped to keep DeSalvo in a psychiatric institution by convincing the judge and jury he was not guilty by reason of insanity. The state offered them a deal. If DeSalvo gave a formal confession, he'd only have to stand trial for his previous crimes, like rape and burglary. He could completely avoid being tried for murder. Bailey hoped that this, along with an insanity plea, could help DeSalvo avoid hard jail time. Unfortunately for Bailey, the jury wasn't convinced. In 1967, when DeSalvo stood trial, he didn't appear incompetent. He was eloquent, almost proud, as he pleaded guilty to his many crimes. The jury emerged with their decision after four hours. They all agreed that the insanity defense did not apply to DeSalvo. He was guilty of all charges, and the judge sentenced him to life in prison. DeSalvo returned to Bridgewater, where he awaited transport to prison. It seemed like he lost all hope. But about a month later, he was presented with an opportunity he couldn't pass up. In February 1967, two men approached DeSalvo in the Bridgewater common room. They were 40-year-old murderer Frederick E. Erickson and 35-year-old armed robber George Harrison. Erickson and Harrison had gotten their hands on duplicates of their cell keys and were planning a jailbreak. They caught wind of DeSalvo's bad luck and thought he'd be as desperate to get out of Bridgewater as they were. It turned out they were right. Coming up, Albert DeSalvo makes a break for it. On the night of February 24, 1967, 36-year-old Albert DeSalvo met up with two other inmates at the Bridgewater State Hospital in Massachusetts. Their names were Frederick Erickson and George Harrison. Somehow, they'd managed to get their hands on duplicate keys that could open their cells and they were planning a jailbreak. Around 2 a.m., DeSalvo heard Erickson and Harrison tapping at his door. He squinted out of his cell's peephole. DeSalvo watched as the two men inserted a shoddy piece of metal in the keyhole. After a few jostles, the heavy door swung open. The men needed to act fast. They had a measly 10 minutes to execute their plan while the guards changed shifts. So they scurried through Bridgewater's winding corridors until they arrived at their tunnel to freedom, an elevator shaft that was under construction. One by one, the men shimmied through the dusty and dilapidated tunnel. Once outside in the bitter New England cold, they just barely made it over the barricade. For a moment, all they could do was stand in disbelief. They were free. And they were ecstatic. But the rest of Boston wasn't nearly as happy. When word got out that the three psychiatric patients, including the presumed Boston Strangler, were on the loose, the city fell into a complete panic. 
Hordes of police officers, armed with rifles and tear gas, searched the area for the three men. While tracks in the snow led to the capture of both Erickson and Harrison, DeSalvo remained a fugitive. Freezing and exhausted, he roamed along highways and through thick backwoods until he arrived in the small town of Lynn, Massachusetts. He broke into a stranger's cellar to warm up and stole an old naval uniform to use as a disguise. Then he simply roamed the streets, formulating his next move. But it quickly dawned on him that there was no next move. His wife and children were gone, and they wanted nothing to do with him. Even if he did try to start his life anew, his face had been on the front page of every newspaper in the country. He had nowhere to hide. With no other option, he stepped into his shoe store and asked to use the phone. You got a phone? I, uh, y yes, are you? Yeah, it's me. Now give me the phone. I gotta call my lawyer. Okay. Everyone in the shoe store knew exactly who he was. While DeSalvo dialed F. Lee Bailey's number, the clerk called the authorities. Minutes later, police descended upon the humble storefront. DeSalvo was detained. This time around, he wouldn't get the luxury of being placed in a psychiatric institution. He was headed straight toward one of Massachusetts' most infamous penitentiaries, Walpole Prison. At the time, Walpole was notorious for unmitigated chaos and guards who were willing to turn a blind eye for the right price. Although it was technically a maximum security institution, it was a distinctly unsafe environment. And at first, DeSalvo wasn't happy to be there. Soon, though, he was reunited with an unexpected face. George Nasser, his former confidant, had also been transferred to Walpole to serve out the remainder of his life sentence. In other words, DeSalvo already had a friend on the inside. The two got to talking. DeSalvo had a plan to turn his situation around, and he wanted Nasser's help. DeSalvo was working on a tell-all book about his many crimes. He believed people would jump at the chance to read the Boston Strangler's sordid story. Nasser agreed to assist DeSalvo in exchange for 50% of the profits. From that moment forward, DeSalvo and Nasser were attached at the hip. They churned out draft after draft of DeSalvo's book and frequently sent pages to publishing houses around the country. And although DeSalvo had found a collaborator in Nasser, the rest of the prisoners wanted nothing to do with him. In fact, he was a walking target. Sex criminals were considered the scum of the earth amongst the inmates of Walpole. Taking out a man like Albert DeSalvo would catapult a person to the top of the prison social hierarchy. Plus, rumor had it that DeSalvo had dipped his toes into the prison drug dealing game. Apparently, he was starting to break the rules. All right, DeSalvo, I'm gonna help you out, and I hope you listen because this is what stands between you living and dying in this place. What are you talking about? You're not as smart as you think you are. Everyone knows you've been selling your own stuff and that you've been undercutting Winter Hill's prices. They basically run this place, so you do not want to cross them. Oh, please. There's enough room for everybody. Those guys are a bunch of thugs anyway. I don't want anything to do with them. Well, you picked the wrong business if that's the case. It, try smuggling in food, booze, cigarettes, but speed? Yeah, that's spoken for. I'm serious, DeSalvo. Yeah, yeah. I'll figure it out. DeSalvo was never one to fall in line. Even though the Winter Hill gang controlled the prison drug trade, DeSalvo reportedly kept trying to get involved. Still, DeSalvo wasn't totally confident. He always slept with one eye open, and it wasn't long before living in fear started taking its toll. Six long years dragged on. DeSalvo had imagined his tell-all book leading to glory and fame, but no publishers wanted to tell such a disgusting story. DeSalvo was never going to be a big shot. He was only ever going to be a prisoner. And this realization left him desperate. Likely as a last ditch effort to escape his fate, he started making plans to recant his confession. <laughs> 
DeSalvo said he only ever claimed to be the strangler in the hope of receiving financial compensation that he could use to help his family. It was a weak excuse, and no one really bought it. But then, in a letter sent to a friend from prison, DeSalvo claimed he had something to reveal to the public. It's time for a new ball game, as it's called. I've got to think of my children and the suffering and burden I've put on them. In time, you'll understand what I'm saying, or trying to say. It'll happen in about a month or so. I'm going to drop a bomb. Word spread around Walpole that DeSalvo was planning to reveal new information about the Strangler case. With the entire prison whispering his name, DeSalvo became more paranoid than ever. He stopped sleeping. He trusted no one. And for good reason. Inmates took DeSalvo's desire to speak out about his own crimes as a sign that he was becoming less trustworthy in general. They feared he might slide in some information about other inmates in hopes of getting preferential treatment. DeSalvo's involvement in the prison drug trade was also getting him some additional heat. He was allegedly selling his own supply of amphetamines at a lower cost than the top drug dealers in prison, namely the Winter Hill Gang. The tension between DeSalvo and the other inmates was palpable. Fearing for his own safety, he asked to be placed in the prison infirmary away from others. Then, on November 25th, 1973, 42-year-old DeSalvo placed a phone call to his former psychiatrist, Dr. Ames Roby. Albert, is that you? Yeah, Doc, it's me. Listen, I gotta meet. We need to talk. It's been years. About what? I want to tell the real story. This has been going on for too long, you know? It's time that the truth comes out. Well, what is the truth, Al? It's not safe to talk here. Come down to Walpole. You can talk then. 9 a.m. Be there. But around 12 hours later... Before Albert DeSalvo could elaborate any further, he was found dead in the infirmary. He'd been stabbed at least 16 times in the chest. Coming up, speculations on Albert DeSalvo's death begin to circulate. Now back to the story. In the early morning hours of November 26, 1973, 42-year-old Albert DeSalvo was murdered in the infirmary of Massachusetts Walpole Prison. This was no petty prison murder. DeSalvo had been stabbed 16 times, and whoever killed him must have planned the ambush meticulously. Getting to the infirmary would likely require an in-depth knowledge of the prison's layout and cooperation from the guards. Even for a notoriously crooked prison like Walpole, the amount of corruption required to pull off a murder like this was astounding. To get to DeSalvo, someone, or perhaps multiple people, would have likely needed to bribe numerous authorities. Plus, by the time any prison employees found a salvo, he'd already been dead for 10 hours. This almost certainly required at least one, if not more, guards to turn a blind eye. In fact, it made it seem possible that jailers, and not just inmates, might have taken an active role in committing the crime. But of course, that raised the question of why? Inmates could have had any reason to target DeSalvo, from his well-known crimes to his supposed drug dealings to his generally bad attitude. However, it was far less clear why guards would be so willing to enable a murder. They might have had a personal agenda against DeSalvo. After all, he'd terrorized Boston for two years. That was reason enough to want him dead. But perhaps guards cooperated because the bribes DeSalvo's murderers offered were too good to ignore. And the only people offering bribes like that were members of the Winter Hill Gang. Eventually, three inmates at Walpole, Carmen Gagliardi, Robert Michael Wilson, and Richard L. Devlin, were arraigned for DeSalvo's killing. It's not quite clear how authorities zeroed in on these three, but Gagliardi, Wilson, and Devlin were all suspected to be members of Winter Hill. It's likely that their supposed gang ties led to their apprehension. 
They went to trial in the fall of 1974, but the proceedings ended with a hung jury. And before they could stand for a retrial in 1975, another death shocked Walpole. Carmen Gagliardi was found killed in his jail cell. Although he died of a heroin overdose, according to a report by the New York Times, it was ruled a homicide. Many believe that he met the same fate as DeSalvo, death by the Winter Hill Gang. Tensions were probably running high amongst gang members after the arraignment. If anyone from Winter Hill was convicted, it could spell doom for the entire organization. So if Gagliardi expressed any sort of guilt, or if he had considered confessing to DeSalvo's murder, his fellow gang members might have eliminated him before it was too late. Devlin and Wilson stood for a retrial on March 6, 1975. This time, the prosecution had a witness on the stands. He was a fellow inmate named Kenneth W. Jackson, and he had a lot to say. Yeah, the day DeSalvo was found dead, I heard Wilson and Devlin talking. Yeah, they weren't even trying to hide it. And Wilson said, by the end of the week, DeSalvo will be eliminated. He said the same thing to Gagliardi. Ask anyone at Walpole. They're all going to tell you the same thing. As compelling as this testimony was, the jury remained undecided due to a lack of physical evidence. Ultimately, no one was ever convicted of Albert DeSalvo's murder. But the major players on DeSalvo's legal team felt certain they knew what had happened. F. Lee Bailey stated that DeSalvo's death was a direct result of his involvement in the drug trade at Walpole. If Devlin, Wilson, and Gagliardi really were in the Winterhill gang, that meant they controlled the prison's amphetamine ring. The gang took notice as DeSalvo rose up the prison ranks, and they weren't happy when he started selling amphetamines below the established price. The gang is believed to have given DeSalvo a firm warning, one that most other inmates would have taken seriously. However, Albert DeSalvo never paid attention to orders, and at Walpole, there were no second warnings. Winter Hill might have opted to kill DeSalvo rather than let him cut into their profits. While this is the most widely accepted theory behind DeSalvo's death, others thought his murder was related to the Boston Strangler's true identity. Many believed his original confession was false and that it was all part of the real Strangler's master plan. They thought DeSalvo was being used as a puppet, and the man pulling the strings was George Nasser. Some claimed that from the start, Nasser had clear influence over DeSalvo's decision to confess. In their eyes, it was possible that Nasser somehow convinced DeSalvo that owning up to the Boston Strangler murders, even if he was innocent, would be good for both of them. Reward money was on the table. People speculated that although Nasser wanted to keep the cash for himself, he could have also promised DeSalvo a cut. As the theory goes, DeSalvo would have no use for the money in prison, but he might have planned to wire the funds to his wife and children. Some thought this idea made sense, but in a 2018 interview, 86-year-old George Nasser denied having any involvement in the Boston Strangler crimes. He vividly recalled DeSalvo's jailhouse confession and said he was absolutely certain that DeSalvo was the Boston Strangler. Officially, George Nasser can't be tied to the strangulations. However, there is one story that can't be ignored. A woman named Marcella Lulka lived in the same apartment building as the Strangler's sixth victim, Sophie Clark. In Gerald Frank's book, The Boston Strangler, he writes about how moments before Clark was murdered, a strange man appeared at Lulka's door. He said his name was Mr. Thompson, and he was there to paint her apartment. She knew something was off, so she shooed him away. A few weeks after her initial testimony, Police called her into the Bridgewater State Hospital. Officers hoped she could identify DeSalvo as the man who came to her apartment. She posed as a visitor in the common room and watched the inmates file in. Her face went pale and the hairs on her neck stood up, but not because she recognized DeSalvo. 
She said she recognized Nasser as the man at her apartment. But still, Lulka couldn't definitively say that he was the man who tried to enter her apartment. Besides a few bizarre coincidences, there's no substantial evidence linking George Nasser to the Boston Strangler killings. Plus, Nasser had his own take on the DeSalvo murder. He claimed DeSalvo had gotten into an argument with a particularly dangerous group of inmates over the cooking of bacon. Things escalated, and he was killed. Killing over bacon might seem extreme, but according to Nasser, that sort of thing wasn't uncommon at Walpole. Even so, the evidence for this theory is thin. DeSalvo's killing seemed far too pointed and methodical to be the result of a disagreement over breakfast. With this in mind, I think it could have been someone from the Winter Hill Gang. They would have had the power to bribe officials and break into the infirmary. I agree. Plus, Carmen Gagliardi's murder seemed to show that gang members wouldn't hesitate to kill those who fell out of line. If DeSalvo crossed them, they could have taken him out. Whatever happened to Albert DeSalvo, his death caused the investigation into the Boston Strangler's murders to go cold. Because DeSalvo never pleaded guilty to the Strangler's crimes in court, nobody was ever formally charged. Thus, the string of slayings that terrified Boston from 1962 to 1964 remained technically unsolved. So in 2000, relatives of Mary Sullivan, the Strangler's youngest victim, exhumed her body. A second autopsy was performed, this time using new genetic technology. The re-autopsy led to the discovery of traces of semen on Sullivan's body. And in 2013, the DNA was found to be a direct match to Albert DeSalvo. With that, Mary Sullivan became the first of the Boston Strangler's victims definitively linked to Albert DeSalvo. This didn't confirm that he was the Strangler, but it certainly made it look very likely. Plus, police have stated that they hope to find DNA evidence to connect DeSalvo to the Strangler's other victims. It's possible that at some point, will have concrete evidence of his guilt. Until then, Albert DeSalvo's ghost hangs over Boston. We don't know exactly who murdered him, and we can't be 100% sure who he killed. All we know is that after the Boston Strangler's reign of terror, the city was never the same. <laughs> 